Glory, 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 glory be to God. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Glory be to God, glory be to God, glory be to God, Hebrews chapter 12. Heavenly Father, thy word is truth. Lord, plant it in our hearts this morning and in our mouths, in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, seeing we are also compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses. That's referring to those witnesses mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm going to tell you, they faced a lot bigger problems than we've ever faced. And we are surrounded with a, a witness of overcomers. They overcame. And the Bible says we're to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Is your testimony, I'm an overcomer? Amen. Amen. Therefore, seeing we are compassed about, we're surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Don't run the race weighted down. And the sin, which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, endurance, the race that is set before us. We are in a race, life is a race. It's either a race to heaven or a race to hell. I said it's a race to heaven or a race to hell. There's no in between. We're to run the race set before us. Not the race you set before you. Not the race others set before you. Not the race the world sets before you. But the race God has set before us. The Bible tells us Paul talked a great deal about these things. He told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, that we are to run in order to win the prize. In other words, run. You know, a lot of people say, well, I just want to participate in a marathon. No, you run to win. The Bible says run the race to win. Not to finish 412th. You got to run the race according to God's rules. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, Only those that obey the rules win the prize. Philippians 2.16, we run holding fast to the word of life. Amen? Amen. And then, of course, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we're to run our race, the race that's set before us, and the only way to finish it is to run it looking unto Jesus. First, we look unto Jesus as an example. How did he run? He said, I do always those things that please the Father. You know, if you're doing something that doesn't please the Father, that's a weight you need to get rid of. We run the race looking unto Jesus for our strength and our supply. My God shall supply all your needs according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Everything that pertains to life and godliness. So this morning I want to talk about one example. We're to run the race looking unto Jesus. I want to look at one example of the life of Jesus as to how he ran, and you'll see that the songs that we sang this morning, which I didn't choose, or Colette didn't know, but God knew, say the same thing that we're going to say. They, they, they are joined together. Perhaps everything that Jesus did, 
You know, Jesus said, I came to seek the lost. I came to do this. I came to do that. And he did everything that he came to do. He finished his race. But he said this, it kind of sums up his life. He didn't list before he went to heaven. He was in the garden praying before the crucifixion. He didn't list all of the individual accomplishments that he did. He didn't mark them off, said, Lord, I did this, I did that. Here's what he said in John 17, 4. He said, I've glorified you on the earth. Amen. If you're going to run the race looking unto Jesus, you're going to run the race with the purpose of glorifying God. He said, I've glorified you on the earth. Some people say, well, I'm going to glorify God when I get to heaven. You might not make it. Come on. Don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Glor run your race glorifying God. Jesus prayed that he would glorify God. Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever prayed, God, help me to glorify? You know, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come, he'll glorify me. He's in us. What's he in us for? Well, yeah, but no, he's in us to glorify. First and foremost, primarily, he's in us to glorify God. He does that by leading us, guiding us, strengthening us. He does that by the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus prayed in John 12, 28. Father, glorify thy name. And you know what? God answered him from heaven. And it said, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Amen? You need to pray, God, glorify your name. Everything in all of God's creation was created to bring glory to Him. All the provisions of God, all the goodness of God is so that we'll bring glory to Him. Everything the Bible says was created for His pleasure and to give glory to Him. Two different scriptures. Now think about this. Since man was created in God's image and in God's likeness, then man is at the top of the creation. We're God's greatest creation, let me put it that way. And all men were created to glorify God, but Christians are at the top of that. And we are not only created in His image and created in His likeness, but we are now in Him and in the family of God. And it is our duty to glorify Him. The Bible is full of statements about God's people. Of course, all those in the Old Testament primarily used the word Israel, but you see, we're God's people today. We've been grafted in. Paul said the Jew is really one inwardly, not outwardly. So all these promises are statements about glorifying God in the Old Testament certainly apply to us. In fact, there's a scripture that says, those who I will create will glorify me. Something like that. I don't have it written down. Just, But Leviticus 10.3 said, Moses said unto Aaron what the Lord told him, and it was, I will be sanctified, that means made holy, in them that come near me, and before all the people, I will be glorified. I will be glorified. You know, when the children of Israel would not go into the promised land, the first generation that came out of Egypt, God said, they've denied me the opportunity to be glorified. You know, every time you disobey God, you've denied God an opportunity to be glorified. The Bible says in Isaiah 61, verse 3, that we might be called trees of righteousness. 
the planning of the Lord that he might be glorified. We're to be trees of righteousness. The Bible says that when Jesus healed the lame and the blind saw, they glorified God. So miracles glorify God. Obedience glorifies God. The Bible says when we take authority over the devil, it glorifies God. The Bible says when we bear much fruit, it glorifies God. Yes, we are, every time we do all of these things, we receive a blessing, but God is glorified, first and foremost. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12 says that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. And you in him, you see, it's reciprocal. According to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God has given every one of us the power to glorify him. Paul said, pray that the word of God may be glorified. Peter said that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Here's something forward, not yet happened. People today are talking about the coming of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 says, When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Do you know when he comes and when that trumpet blows and the, the dead in Christ are raised and those of us who are alive and remain are caught up to meet him in the air, he shall be glorified. We are not the subject of the sentence. He is. But another way that we can and we must and we're expected to glorify God is through praise and worship. You know, we sang that song this morning, when I found the joy of reaching your heart. The Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. And David was the number one worshiper of all time. I said David was the number one praiser and worshiper of all time. When I find the joy of reaching your heart, I'm telling you today where it is. It's in praising and worshiping him. Psalm 50 verse 23 says so. It says, whoever offers praise glorifies me. You know, we used to sing that. You know, when, I, when we first came into this Pentecostal Word of Faith movement, we were at a little church that just sang right out of the King James Bible, every, every song. They'd say, open to Psalm 50, 23. And we'd sing, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that orders his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. Amen? God does not bless wrong. God blesses right. Whoever offers praise glorifies God. Jesus said, I've glorified you. Do you want to run the race looking under Jesus? Glorify God. You're not going to maybe do the things that Jesus did. And certainly we aren't going to do most of them. But we can glorify God with our praise. I said we can glorify God with our praise. I said we can glorify God with our praise. Amen. Psalm 145, verse 10. All your works shall praise you. That doesn't just mean the grass and the trees. We're the primary work of God. All your works shall praise you and your saints shall bless you. 
Don't ever think you're not a saint because the Bible says every born again Christian is a saint. Man, men don't declare people saints. God does. And then it says, my mouth shall speak of the praises of the Lord. And all flesh shall bless his holy name on the third Sunday of the month. <laughs> no, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. You know, the, Jesus said... Pray this, pray this way, with this attitude. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, be, that means may your name be kept holy. Well, who can keep the name of God holy? Only those who have it. Amen? We're the only ones that have the name. I've told this before, you know, my dad, when I first got out of the army, I was a tad bit rebellious. <laughs> and I didn't shave for a couple days and my dad says to me you need to stand a little closer to your razor and I the only time really that I ever smarted off to him in my life <laughs> you know I was at the grocery store yesterday and I heard some little kid there was a whole family of people there and the little kid was saying mama he smacked me mama he smacked me you know to the brother he smacked me well I learned early on you don't you don't mouth off to your father you don't get smacked you know spanked but we are here to glorify God forever and ever. We are the only ones with his name. Amen. Amen. Moses built a tabernacle. When they came out of Egypt, God gave him this intricate plans for a tabernacle. All, all kind of things, you know, made of this skin, made of that color, made of this material. All that and then the Ark of the Covenant and then later on when they were in the land God had Solomon to build a temple and the temple was after the exact pattern as the tabernacle the te temporary the, the the portable thing in the desert that went with them but the same thing happened when they finished the temple and well actually when they finished and set up the tabernacle in the wilderness for the first time the Bible says this in Exodus chapter 40 verse 34 then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle you know what they called it the place of meeting it's where they met God it's where Moses met God Moses would go in there and the Bible says and you know talk about a man of God the Bible says and his servant Joshua didn't go out he stayed in the temple he stayed in the tabernacle in the presence of God did it do him any good it not only did him good it did the whole nation good but the Bible says when they finished it the glory of God filled the temple but now when they built the temple the, or filled the tabernacle when they built the temple it says in 2nd Chronicles chapter 5 verse 13 it says it came to pass when the trumpeters that's the musicians and the singers were as one what, what, what does that mean? They are of one mind, one purpose. To make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voices with the trumpets and the cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. That the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. That's the, called the Shekinah glory of God. The presence of God filled it because of their praise and worship. But between the time that, of the tabernacle and the temple, David made his own 
tabernacle, King David. Because you see, they had lost the Ark of the Covenant, which God dwelled between the cherubim on top of the Ark. And they lost it during the reign of King Saul and David. One of the first things he did was he said, we've got to find the Ark of the Covenant and bring it back. It had been gone for years. And Saul hadn't looked for it. The priests hadn't looked for it. But David looked for it and found it. And they brought it back and he said, well, you know what? I'm going to keep it. I have found the presence of God. I'm going to keep it. So he made his own tabernacle. Now, now, now the tabernacle that Moses had built was still standing at a place called Shiloh. But David knew they didn't give a hoot about God. They only wanted their rituals. And so he brought, 1 Chronicles 16, 1 says, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. doesn't tell us much about what it was made of. It wasn't all this that the, the tabernacle of, of Moses was or the temple. It just, it just was a tent. doesn't tell us what was, else was in it except the Ark of the Covenant. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Can you imagine how mad the religious priests were? He's got the ark. We're supposed to have the ark. We've been pretending to have it for 20 years. And now he's got it. We can't pretend anymore. Then he distributed to everyone of Israel, both men and women, to everyone a loaf of bread. That's a lot of bread. They had a big bakery. A piece of meat and a cake of raisins. And he, here's what he did. He appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to record. David would go down there and worship and get in the spirit and write his psalms. And to record what he said, to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. He was a man after God's heart. Amen? What's the way to God's heart? Praise. Sincere praise. Truthful praise. The whole purpose of the tabernacle, the ark in David's tabernacle, was to prepare a place for God to dwell and to be worshipped and to be praised. You know, the Bible says... God, this is Psalm 22, verse 3, it says, God inhabits the praises of Israel. Today we would say God inhabits the praises of his people. He says, you that fear the Lord, praise him. All the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. Well, today you're the temple of God. You're the temple of God. And you're the singers in the prayer. You're it. You're the band. Psalm 27, verse 6, David said, And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies, which are round about me. Therefore will I offer in the tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Why? Because of the enemies are round about you. The Bible says, out of the mouth of babes, God has perfected strength, which the New Testament says is praise. I will sing, yeah, I will sing praises unto the Lord. You know, there's an often overlooked scripture that we need to look upon and not overlook. And that's in Colossians chapter 3. I'll never forget the first time I heard this scripture declared. Colossians 3, 3 says, For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. Christ is our life. Christ, you know, that's an overlooked scripture. Why? Because I, I don't, I don't want to guess as to why it's overlooked, but it's overlooked. But again, the Bible says, God inhabits the praises of his people. God inhabits. 
You, what happened when they praised God in the old tabernacle, in the old temple? They were filled with the glory of God. The Bible says, I, Paul said, I pray that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You're never going to do that unless your mouth is full of praise. You're not going to be filled with the fullness of God. We have an example of how to be filled with the fullness of God. And that's to praise Him. That's to worship Him. Or to magnify Him. The Bible says it's a good thing. Another song, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises, O Most High, unto thy name, O Most High. David said, I'll praise you with my whole heart. The New Testament says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. How are you going to draw near to God? By worshiping him. God inhabits the praises of his people. One translation says, you are enthroned upon the praises of your people. Another one says, you dwell amid the praises of your people. The Passion Translation, which is kind of a wordy translation, says, yet I know that you are most holy. It's indisputable. You are God enthroned, surrounded with songs, living among the shouts of praise of your princely people. Princely, you know we're princely people? Amen. You know, the Bible says you're a chosen generation, a holy nation that should show forth the praises of God. We're a holy nation. Psalm 34, verse 3. The Bible says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Yes, exactly what, G what Colette said. To magnify the Lord is to exalt him. The word means to make him large. To make great or important. You know the children of Israel, God said, here's this God who showed himself greater than the armies of Pharaoh. Who showed himself greater than the Red Sea. Yet, when God told them to go into the promised land, they were afraid of a few giants. And they magnified the giants above God. They said... They're so big, we're just grasshoppers in their sight and in our own sight. If you make yourself a grasshopper, you'll be a grasshopper. If you see yourself as, see the Bible says, as a man believes in his heart, so is he. We got to see ourselves like God sees us. We're more than conquerors. The Bible, Jesus. David said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. How do you magnify God? You exalt his name. You exalt his name. You make him large. You know, you hear people all the time talking about this sickness, that sickness, some other sickness. You'll never hear me talking about sickness. You never have and you never will because I magnify by his stripes I'm healed. You want to walk in health? Don't magnify the attack of the enemy. Amen. Magnify, he's the Lord my healer. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth me. Let us exalt his name together. Psalm 69, 30, I will praise the name of God with a song and magnify him with thanksgiving. Thank God he's your healer. Thank God he's your provider. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. If you want to make, now this is almost what Colette said. If you want to make God large in your life, 
and make Him larger than any problem or situation in your life, now or in the future. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. That's just about what she said. The Bible says, Let the Lord be magnified continually. Let those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. This is Psalm 70, verse 4. And let such as love thy salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. Let God be magnified. David said, I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Charles Finney was the greatest American evangelist. And we've had some great ones. Jonathan Edwards in the first great awakening with George Whitfield. The second great awakening, there was several people, more people involved because the nation was much bigger a hundred years later. But the biggest reviver evangelist was Charles Finney and he obviously was chosen of God for that because the day he got saved revival broke out in his hometown but he wrote a message he wrote several books but he wrote one message that the Lord brought to my remembrance this morning. And it was entitled, When a Revival of the Fear of the Lord is Needed. You see, if you don't fear the Lord, that means to reverence Him, to magnify Him, to worship Him. So when a revival of the fear of the Lord is needed, and he made a whole list of things, and he, you know... People talk about cutting people slack. He didn't cut you any slack. I mean, zero. But here's the words of Charles Finney. Now, I'm going to add some things to it. But here's what Charles Finney said. In about 1850, right around there. 140, 50 years ago. He said... A revival of the fear of the Lord is needed. Notice he didn't just say a revival, but a revival. You know, the Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. You know why there's so many dumb Christians? I just told you why. <laughs> when is there a lack of brother? He says, that you, when is a revival needed? When there is a lack of brotherly love among the brethren when there's a lack of confidence in God and God's truthfulness when Christians have sunk down into a low and backslidden state the, a revival of the fear of the Lord is needed when compassion is lacking not God's compassion our compassion when there are dissensions jealousies and evil speaking among the brethren when there's a worldly spirit in the church when the church finds its members falling into gross and scandalous sins when there's a spirit now listen to this when there's a spirit of controversy in the church or in the land you know I, I read well I'll, well, I'll say this a little bit later. There's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed when the wicked triumph over the church. When the church is not being salted, salt and light. There's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed when there's ingratitude to God. When there's a want of love to God. When there's a neglect of the Bible. When there's unbelief. When there's a neglect of prayer. When there's a neglect of church attendance. When we walk by sight and not by faith. 
when there's a want of prayer for the heathen and a neglect of self-denial. You know, we said that uh, our life is hid in Christ and Christ says our life is a neglected scripture, but here's another one. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, deny yourself daily. And I'll add, now the, Charles Finney said all that, but in 150 years, we got a right to add to his list, don't we? You know, I'll add when there's a lack of praise of God in Jesus. There's a lack, there's a revival of the fear of the Lord is needed. I'll tell you what else. All week the Lord was talking to me. Out on the table out there, there's one of these brochures and, and this one. They're put out by two different Christian groups. This one, of course, is more colorful. It's also a door hanger. You can hang it on those where you see an evil sign in the yard. <laughs> You say, what do you mean? Well, I'll just tell you. Do you know, just this week, there's a revival of the fear of the Lord is needed when at a political rally for someone running for the President of the United States and someone said... I wrote it down here. When someone said, Jesus is Lord, and then the person with him said, Christ is King. When that person running for president said, you're at the wrong rally. A revival of the fear of the Lord is needed. I said a revival when, when, when people would gather to listen to someone who says that, instead of Jesus is Lord, there's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed. Now, just looking at these things here, there's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed when people want abortion up to the ninth month. And they want you to pay for it. There's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed. There's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed when we have same-sex marriage legalized. We have, there's a need for a revival of the fear of the Lord when doctors, and I use that term very loosely, operate on children to change their sex. That's demonic. That's demonic. There's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed when parents would allow that, when doctors would do it. And there's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed when politicians support it. There's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed when anti-Semitism is rampant in the land. There's a revival of the fear of the Lord needed when we have a political party that the number one plank in their platform is abortion. We have a... You know, we have, there's a, there's a need for revival of the fear of the Lord when you find males in the girls' locker room and the girls' toilets in, in schools. And when you find so-called wannabes or pretenders, men on girls' basketball or girls' sports teams. Thank God, you know, there's a... I can't think of the name of it, but they're, they're starting to rebel. You know, there's some boy playing on the volleyball team of some California school 
and the other either the school or in this case this last case the players refuse to play Amen. refuse to play we're not playing that game Amen. we're not going there we're not doing that a revival of the fear of the Lord is needed amen, amen. a revival of the fear of the Lord Brother Hagan used to define the fear of the Lord as an awesome dread of displeasing him. Amen. Charles Finney didn't mention any of these things because they didn't even hadn't even come into anybody's mind in his day that anybody would propose such outlandish things as this. And I'll, I'll just tell you what, a revival of the fear of the Lord is needed when fathers don't go and knock some sense into somebody. Yeah. Do would do that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But we're going to fear the Lord and we're going to magnify Him above these things. Amen? So I encourage you, pick these, pick one of these up and one of these up and, you know... Since these things are going on in this nation, it's important that we register. To, if you're not registered to vote, you've got just a few days to do it. And then vote. And praise and magnify God continuously. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love. We thank you that you're a great and wonderful God. And we just give you praise and glory and honor and thanksgiving. And Father, we thank you that these wicked things will not stand in our land. In the name of Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. amen.